welcome back to the Space Koala. My name is Luta and today I'm back with another smart telescope review. Today we have the new EduSnap Astro Smart Telescope, which currently still in the phase of the Kickstarter project is costing $159. We have to ask the question, how is this one really different from all the previous ones? I'm very intrigued to find out because they are promising a lot and it has one quite unique feature that no other smart telescopes have. Let's get into it. So this is the actual EduSnap smart telescope. Everything you see here, apart from the power bank that it's connected to, is included in the package. So you get the actual optics. It is a 53 millimeter diameter ED glass apochromatic refractor. You get the motorized alt azimuth mount and you get the tripod. The tripod can also be extended or lowered. On the mount itself, you have zero buttons. You just have the two USB plugs, one that is connected to a power source it does not have an integrated battery and then the other cable connects the mount to the back of the scope which is essentially the camera. We haven't really answered the question what's unique about the telescope though. Well it comes with an actual eyepiece. It's an actual regular one and a quarter inch eyepiece. So how do you achieve a smart telescope with a camera but also an eyepiece? It has a diagonal mirror that is a flip mirror. Currently the mirror is up here it is straight so all the light is coming through back here where there's a sensor if i flip it down all the light is coming straight up into the eyepiece so in the photographic mode everything goes straight on to the sensor which is an imx 662 it is a small planetary camera sensor with tiny pixels so you would see you would have a decent resolution on objects obviously it is daytime but i cannot wait to try it so what can i do i can try to have a look at the sun for observing the sun you actually get two different tools included you have a solar filter and this is quite nice because it is in a metal enclosure you just put it on the front of the telescope and you also get a solar finder you can just snap it on so let's have a look at the sun when we have the solar finder dot centered, we can expect to see the sun in the field of view. There's the sun all right. It is perfectly centered and there's like a million sunspots today. We can switch to the camera view. I have centered the sun and we can see all these sunspots. You can now take a series of pictures, which I can do. I can take a series of, let's say 20 pictures. There is no way to take a video currently. So we'll just take these pictures and see what comes out. So that pretty much concludes what you can do during the day as for the sun. Since you also have the whole visual part, it is not taking anything away from it being an actual physical telescope. You can also use it as a spotting scope in the daytime. Like I'm here in the mountains and I have just pointed somewhere in the distance and I can see one mountain top, that one with some snow on it. Of course, if you're pointing at something that is nearer than the absolute distance you will have to adjust the focus and that is done by twisting this ring here. I want to see if I can show you what it looks like in the eyepiece. My life would be a lot easier if I had brought a phone adapter with me. I can get it through the camera. And we have it. We are seeing some nice snowy mountains in the distance. I can also pan and control which region I want to see. We are pointing there. I think that was pretty much it for the daytime testing. I cannot wait to try out what it can actually deliver under the stars. It is finally nighttime, so I get to try out the telescope under the stars. As the first thing, I pointed it to comet C2023A3 Sachinshan Alice, which is the bright comet of this period. And I can see it. It's full of satellites passing right in front of the comet. Okay, that's finally a good position. Now I will take shots of 10 seconds, maybe 10 of them, because anyway, it's going to go below the horizon. You cannot go away from the telescope with your phone because the stacking is actually being done in the app. So it has to be continuously receiving the images from the telescope as opposed to doing it inside. Like there's no computer. Oh, we have the comet. This kind of ties in with the fact that this is not meant to be an astrophotography device. This is meant to be a visual device that is smart 
for beginners to be able to find deep sky objects that otherwise might be very difficult to locate. Somebody that wants to get to know the sky and doesn't want to buy something huge for a lot of money that is difficult to carry around, essentially they can you know, use this, use the software to locate whatever deep sky objects they want to do in the sky and then flip over to the mirror and actually see it with their eyes. This is how I envision using it. So we have our picture of 10 out of which only five were stacked. I think it like discards the bad frames. I will save this image. Now that there's no more rush, I can actually show how the app is built and how the whole thing is to be used. On the landing screen, there is the left hand side, which has like information about your location, a portal for class, which is considered dark and stars, which is actually a button. And then if I go in there, this is where it lets you select all the objects that you can form a go-to on. Tonight is also available from this menu on the right hand side. And then finally at the bottom here, you have some sort of guidance and settings. I will be now performing another go-to and just demonstrating how this works. So I, I let's go on M45. The way the go-to works is it goes at the point in the sky where it thinks that the object is. It takes a picture, it place solves it. If it is centered, then it finalizes it. If it's not centered, it, it calculates how much it is off by and then it corrects it. It does another go to, it does another plate solve and so on and so on. And it does then star identification. And then when it says go to success, it shows you like the identified stars in the field that it's seeing. So then you click on next. If I switch to the live view, then I see M45 centered. So I will now go ahead and take a few pictures of this. I did a stack here of 11 frames out of which 10 were stacked. I think a lot more time would have been needed for it to actually pick up on the faint nebulosity. Now I want to say let's do something a bit more difficult, like something that is not a naked eye object, like M27, which is the dumbbell nebula. It is something that you would not be able to find with a telescope of this size without some sort of an automated system. Now that we have M27, I will switch to visual. You can see it with averted vision. In case you don't know what that is, the sides of the retina are a little more sensitive to light than the center. So if you look next to an object, you can see it ever so slightly better than if you're looking directly at it. Let's do something here in the Milky Way. Let's do a star cluster. I'm thinking, M38. When you're browsing the objects in the catalog, it tells you some information about each of them. So I'm doing a go to on M38. Now you will notice that the movement of the telescope is not very fast. Okay, so it says that it has successfully done it. And I'm literally seeing the tip of the mountain there with some stars around it. Let me just try to show you what that looks like. All right, so I see M38 on the left but I also see that it's not actually tracking. It definitely has a few bugs. I've had this before when I first started shooting one of the objects and at first it was not tracking and then it started without me having done anything at all. I waited like five more minutes and I managed to take a stack of the M38 star cluster. There's the wind like blowing off dried leaves from the trees and every time it makes the creepiest sound and it is halloween so it is very much the vibe i had to come back inside because it was so cold i did a couple more observations uh, both visually and photographically i took some pictures i will just show all the pictures that i took obviously this tiny refractor telescope is not for observing planets but i tried anyway because i saw jupiter come up behind the mountain so why not try? At this diameter, you're anyway able to resolve the Galilean moons of Jupiter. And then I also took a couple of pictures at different exposure times, because here you can see the Galilean moons with Jupiter that is overexposed. And then I took a single shot of Jupiter, hoping to see some detail, but I, I couldn't. This is my stack of the Andromeda galaxy. I think this is a stack of 20 frames. It was a nice view in the eyepiece. It was a similar view to what I see in my pair of binoculars 
And after Andromeda, I said, okay, let's go for everyone's favorite, the Orion Nebula. It was a beautiful view also in the eyepiece. You could see the faint nebulosity around the trapezium region. Obviously it showed up very nicely after just a single shot, but I, I did a stack. So this is the Orion Nebula. You see some hot pixels here, and that is because I wasn't using dark frames. They offered the possibility of using dark frames. The reason I didn't use them was because they don't seem to be storing the dark. So every time you start an observation, it makes you essentially create a master dark which i think is taking like maybe 20 times 15 seconds something like that i just turned that option off i'm pretty sure that in the future the idea is that they would store the master darks it's just not implemented yet or the last target let's go for something that you would never be able to find visually and so i went for the horse head and the flame nebula which you can kind of see here given enough time and patience this telescope will deliver views of some of these targets that would otherwise not be visible it would be out of reach with a telescope of this size and that concludes the test i have to say the company reached out to me and they sent this to me so i didn't purchase it it is not yet on the market that said i have nothing to lose or to gain from disclosing my actual thoughts and opinions about it so let's see the good the bad and the ugly what i like about this telescope is it kind of delivers exactly what they're promising this company is not giving you unreasonable expectations they say exactly who it is targeted for it's an educational tool mainly for children for kids that want to learn about space it helps them find the objects and that's exactly what it does and since they're already doing the tracking and they have the camera inside and they said well let's also do some live stacking so that people can even observe objects that otherwise would remain invisible also photographically were we not to do stacking all that said i would like to stress out that this is not an entry-level astrophotography telescope this is a smart telescope for mainly visual use of course you can take some pictures with it however at this stage it is not focused on taking images i remember when i was a child i wanted a telescope i would have killed if i had something like this because they found a way to use technology but still keep some of the true visual astronomy aspect of it and kids especially can get closer to space by seeing more without being disheartened by the fact that it is difficult for them to find objects i think it's the best way to use technology i would totally buy it for a kid who wants a telescope provided that by the time the actual product comes out i'm sure that most of the bugs and the instability of the software will be resolved thank you very much for watching if you're not yet subscribed to the space koala channel consider doing so because i do have a number of other smart telescope videos coming up in the pipeline and i wish you clear skies